opening Bible to the book of Genesis. We're in a series called Family, uh, Marriage and Family. Um, I don't remember how many studies I've been into this, but we're in the adult life. We've been taking our studies from the adult life of Jacob. In chapter 26, 34, we know he's 40 years of age. Uh, because Esau's age is given and they were twins. So we know that when this wedding is taking place, he's 40 or, or, or maybe a little older. But he's around 40 when this takes place. That's Genesis 26, 34. I don't know if it's on your paper or not, but it's just a reference idea. And last week, we, we uh, attended his uh, wedding uh, after seven years of working for Rachel, this was his big moment. And uh, he had worked for a dowry for seven years and was not aware, apparently, of a special custom of Mesopotamia regarding the marriage of the firstborn daughter, uh, Genesis twenty nine twenty six, And... Uh, and so I get my lesson title. You know, some lessons are hard. The hard, the, some lessons are hard. Hard lessons of life. Uh, the fewer you can have of those, the better off you are. <laughs> I guess by now we all know that. <clears throat> but uh, we've probably all heard that, haven't we? We've all heard that expression. Uh, I know my grandfather used to use it all the time. You can learn. He used to say all the time to me, now, son, you can learn it the hard way or the easy way. You can, whatever I was doing, he said, there's a hard way to do this and an easy way. So, you know, you'd be a smart guy if you learn to do it the easy way. And uh, my grandfather would often let me go ahead and do it the hard way so that I'd have a reference point the next time he said it. Of course, I didn't know it at the time. I only saw it later in my life. But what great lessons they were for me as a kid growing up with a grandfather who dealt with me that way. Well, here we are. Looking at verse 24, I'm in 29. I want to call your attention to Laban. Uh, uh, he gives, and this is a sign of wealth, each of his daughters who gets married, he gives them a handmaiden. Uh, a servant. That's that's their gift for their for each and each bride that he gives. Now, so he gives Leah in twenty four. He gives Leah, Leah Zelpha, which is really going to become interesting because she's going to give birth to some of the sons of Israel. Uh, and then uh, and then we have the morning the morning after the wedding, after the honeymoon, uh, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, what is this you have, you have done to me? Was it not for Rachel I served with you? Why then have you deceived me? And Laban responded, it is not the practice in our, our, our custom, our place, to marry off the younger before the firstborn. Uh, complete the work week of this one, and we will give you the other also for the service which you shall serve with me for another seven years. Now, Jacob doesn't have to take that deal, right? I mean, the first time he didn't have a choice in it, did he? God eliminated all of his choices. But second time he has a choice, and it's very important, the decisions you make when you have choices not when you don't. Jacob did so and completed her week and he gave him his daughter Rachel as his wife and then gave her Belka as her handmaid servant. So Jacob went into Rachel also and indeed he loved Rachel more than Leah and he served with Laban another seven years. That's 14 for Rachel, isn't it? The dowry was seven, now it's 
14. The Lord saw that Leah, and I, verse 31 is really important. The Lord saw that Leah was unloved, and he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. He opened one, shut one. Leah conceived. Now watch 32, 33, 34, 35, because it's all about conceive. This is Leah. The Lord opened her womb. Leah conceived a son and named him Reuben. Reuben, and here's the idea behind his name. Uh, because the Lord has seen my affliction. Surely now my husband will love me. A lot of, a lot of women make that mistake. Then she conceived again, second son, and bore a son. And she's going to call him Simeon, Simon because, and here's that name, because the Lord has heard that I am un unloved. The, S Simon means uh, prayer answered. The Lord has seen my prayer. And what is her prayer? Yeah, I'm, I'm unloved. My husband doesn't love me. And who does he love? Her, her sister. Now that's got to be a grind. Uh, he has therefore given me this son also. So she named him Simon. She conceived again. This is the third time. And bore a son and said. And here is, here is Levi. And here's what this is about. Now this time my husband will become attached, and that's the word for Levi, will, will become attached to me. What's, what's she looking for there? Intimacy, right? She's hoping that somehow, you ever heard the third is a charm, third time's a charm? This is what she's, this is what she's hoping, isn't it? Because, and this is the idea, because I it gave him three sons, therefore, she called him Levi. She'll, he'll, he'll attach himself to me affectionately. Did you notice in the first son, um, afflictions? That's the inner struggle of a soul of a woman who should be loved and isn't. And, and it's called affliction there. And what she wants down here in naming her child. See, she's naming her children based on conflict in her soul, isn't it? The misery of not being loved by this man. Not, not feeling affection that should be there. And... Uh, she conceives a fourth time in verse 35 and has the son Judah, which means praise the Lord. Praise. Notice, if you have a study Bible, they've underlined these words that are what the name is responsive to. This time I will praise the Lord. And this is a big change in her life. Therefore, she named him Judah. Then she stopped bearing. She's, that, that's all, it's all over. And um, how many kids she have? Four. But the last one was a big life changer for her. She finally came to some real grips in her life. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about Jacob and Leah. And we're going to talk about hard lessons of life. I mean, sometimes the hand that's dealt with is a hard land because, because there's no options in it. This is how Leah got in his life. No options. It, was, it wasn't a choice, was it? <clears throat> but once he got married, now, 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 now there are choices being made, and, and now, now the game's on. And hard lessons of life. I mean, how do we deal with them? Um, and the Bible's full of them. I mean, one of his sons is going to go through this. A kid, a, one of the children of Rachel 
is going to go through this called guy called Joseph. Hard lessons of life. And at some point you turn it over to the Lord and and he put sunshine where there was gloom and darkness. That's what happened to her, the fourth child. She finally lived in the light of Christ. How do I know it? Praise the Lord. I mean, she hadn't said that before. Praise the Lord. There's a, there's a real life change. She's still in her, she's still in struggle. Her husband still doesn't love her. Right? St still not showing any affections in her life, things that she desires. But now it's okay. She, she, and she hasn't resolved it. Well, this is the way it's going to be. Nah, 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 nah. She didn't do it that way. She turned it over to the Lord. See what I mean? She turned it over to the Lord. So she can have peace in her journey. She can fulfill her responsibilities in the marriage. And, uh, but anyhow, well, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get into this study. You want to come on, friend, and then we'll pray. He saved you everything but a piece of carrot cake. Yes, I do. <laughs> uh, sorry, but there was one piece left, and he ate it. Uh, let's let's pray to so get allow her to get back in fellowship. <laughs> oh my goodness! I gave you a moment of silence as a believer, priest, and dwelt with the Holy Spirit. The privilege to confess sin, if necessary. Those that are with us, at least in Bible study, know our procedure. For those on the internet, this is because you can't study the Bible in carnality. It's a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Confession of sin is necessary. You can't study the Bible in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. 1 John 1, 9 says, confess your sin. That You can do it through your priesthood, 1 Peter 2. And you take care of your own business. Allow the Holy Spirit to indwell you and teach you the truth of the word of God. There's something in this lesson for you. You wouldn't be here. So, Father, we thank you tonight for these that have come our way by automobile and internet. And we pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the word of God as he has been declared his responsibility. He is the spirit of truth. We pray for that tonight in Jesus name. Amen. Yes, it is. Yep. Shows disconnect. Shows his. Nah. That you're absolutely right. Oh yeah. Yeah. He's willing to father him, but not willing to father him. All right. And listen, listen. At some point, I'm going to tell you in the story, but. This is going to, you, you know the rest of this story, don't you? I mean, you, you, you have studied, we've gone through this. You have studied the life of, of Jacob through his children. They're a mess, right? You see, I mean, they're willing to kill Joseph. I mean, this whole thing just stretches all the way out into the, the you talk, they've got, listen, here's what, here's how it starts. Now listen to me. It starts with a dysfunctional family, a marriage, a dysfunctional marriage goes into a dysfunctional family that goes into dysfunctional children. Even the saved ones are dysfunctional. This is the most dysfunctional family you would ever hope. And listen, they're believers and they're all, listen, they're all believers and they're, they're all engaged with this stuff and just out in the toolies, as we might say. We in the farm country, we say that. So there are times in the Christian way of life when there are hard lessons of life to learn. But sometimes we make them harder than they need to be because of bad decisions of old man, Cosmos thinking 
that worldly thinking, that are in opposition. Now, listen, when you don't have when you don't have options, then it's not because of bad decisions. You may struggle with a hand that's been dealt you by God, like 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 Job. I mean, at one point, is that when the options are gone, then it's about the angelic conflict, right? But once the, the directive will of God is revealed to you, then now it's about options. Now you're in the warfare of the angelic conflict, right? And this is really important. You learn this list because this is the way life is. Life is this way. If you study the life of any of the people, David or anybody, you're going to find this principle to be true. It's going to be true in your life too. It's going to be true in your life, my life. And so when it comes to a point where you have to make decisions, this now the buck stops at your door. Or uh, the, anyhow, where the buck stops? <laughs> uh, Deanna, Deanna was coming home from the Auburn game, the last Auburn game, and the buck stopped in her, in her car. <laughs> Got her. Got her coming home. So I don't know where the buck stops, but... Uh, should stop with God for sure. Um, when you look at when you look at the passage we just read, which was uh, Genesis twenty nine twenty four through um, what thirty, I want you to I want you to divide it in two parts. Now I didn't do it for you, but I would encourage you to do it for yourself. Divide it in two parts, twenty four through thirty, and thirty one through thirty five, because when you read it carefully, you'll see that it, there's kind of a division there. And Rick really hit this on the head. She's doing all the naming. And Rick, she's calling all of her kids by her misery out of her soul, isn't she? I mean, she calls them by, by the day. I mean, put that in your little, put that little in your, in your children's book, you know, that you give them when they grow up. And you go like, here's the history of your life now that you're married. Uh, maybe nobody else does that. Uh, ver look at here's what we have in verses 24 through 30 we have a double wedding we have a double service and we have double handmaids given and they all play an enormous part in biblical history all of this is played out in biblical history i mean and what you learn from that is is listen i i suppose another adage but you know god can make lemonade out of lemons I mean, this is the story of this family. I mean, this story, listen, this story would have really gone bad had God not stepped in and intervened in certain places. These brothers were going to kill Joseph. They were, they were actually, and listen, they, they did, what they did, what they did to their father was unthinkable. They staged David's death and convinced their father that an animal had killed him. Not an animal tried to, but I mean, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, an animal. And what they did to their father was unthinkable. And they didn't care because, listen, they just gave it back where it came from. See, that's the way some people think, right? Payback time. I don't know what's going through their heads, but that's what was coming out of their life. But something changes in verses 31 through 35. And a lot of times we don't pay attention to some of these things. We just kind of read through it. Oh, well, they're having kids, yada, yada, yada. And don't pay attention to what's going on. And, and this is very important to biblical history. Uh, the Lord saw Leah's affl afflictions in her marriage. Now, I want you to always remember that. Now, this could be on the man's side or the woman's side. Depends on where it is. But... What I love about this passage in my own thinking is the fact that God cares about the stuff going on in your life that nobody else may care about. He does. Now, her husband doesn't care that she's in affliction. He knows this. There's no way he cannot know this. Rachel knows this. I'm going to tell you the person that knows it that counts is the Lord. If you think all he does is just kind of business, he does an eight to five or whatever it is, and don't pay about the little things going on in your life, this Bible study story tells you God cares about the little things going on in your life. H how your heart feels. Listen to that. Where is this affliction taking place? In her heart. 
God looks in into your heart. That's why it's important to make sure the Bible is there so that when he's there with you, talking to you, you're on the same page with him. Isn't that good? You know, that's at, that's at Hebrews 4.12. Point number one, I got four ideas here for tonight. It is interesting to me that no one, and I've studied this a lot, of course, over the years. It is interesting to me that no one in the family or in the community, told Jacob about this special Mesopotamian custom. Now, this was special. Jacob's mother was married from this custom. She come from this family. Laban, and her, Laban is her brother. And when uh, Isaac, Isaac come and got his bride, you know, this is where his bride came from. Listen, Jacob's mother was married from this custom. His mother was married out of this custom. Her brother Laban knew it, knew this custom well. He grew up in this custom. Rachel and Leah knew about it and didn't give him a heads up. Rachel nor Leah gave him a heads up, right? He's in love. He's, he's, he's a heads over heels with Rachel. She doesn't give him a heads up. I mean, how, how are we not talking about any of this? Right? See? Well, I don't know. I mean, he wasn't from there, was he? No. But his family was. I mean, I really don't know. I'm just saying it's interesting to me when I read all this because we're in the we're really into details on this story that nobody tells him. Nobody talks about it. Now, listen, when I, when I was getting married, everybody was talking about it. They talked about everything. My uncles were giving me all kinds of advice that I really didn't need. <laughs> See, but it's interesting to me because it's just, listen, most people know about this. Most people know about this stuff. Uh, I mean, people talk about it when you're about to get married. And it's just interesting to me that nobody talks about this. It's interesting that no one in the family earth committee told Jacob about this special Mesopotamian custom. They knew how, how Jacob was looking forward to, to marry Rachel. Uh, um, none of his co-workers, you know, he's working with people, right? Yeah, nobody. Listen, when I was about to get married, that's all they, I mean... Well, you think somebody would, wouldn't you? She knew that her sister had to be married off first. I know. I mean, how's this stuff working? But I don't know. I'm just saying this is kind of interesting to me. Uh, having gotten married myself, I just know how this subject becomes a big thing with everybody around you. And I, it, and it, I don't know. Sometimes, and so I think to myself, sometimes we don't do our homework. That's a possibility. Maybe we don't do our homework. We let others do it. But when they do, you got to accept a grade. When somebody else does your homework, you got to accept a grade. Agreed? Now, that may be good. That may be bad. But that's the way the deal works. Sometimes we don't pay attention to important wedding details. Because we are blinded by our focus on love and honeymoon rather than the wedding itself. I never had one guy I ever married that wouldn't have loved to elope. The worst thing they want to do is dress up and walk down the aisle. And <laughs> is there not an easier way to do this? Uh, and I think that everybody in the family knows that if they put them through this, He'll probably never, he'll never go through that ever again. And so let's get, that, that, that may be the only thing that keeps him married. The idea that I'll never do that again. I don't know. I'm just saying. Reality, in fact, though, is what we have to deal with in our real life. On Jacob's wedding day, Jacob married Laban's firstborn daughter. That's reality and that's fact. And behold, it was Leah. 
According to the scripture, it wasn't a surprise to anyone at the wedding but Jacob. And here's where the lesson gets harder or easier depending on Jacob's choices now. Because he is married and he is married to Leah. And monogamy is the name of the game if you're a believer. Monogamy. Monogamy. Right out of Genesis, the second chapter, 18 through 25. Verse 22 especially. Here's the second idea. Jacob can accept his wife as a gift of God's grace, like Proverbs 18, 22 says. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor or grace from the Lord. Now he's got a wife. He's got a wife. He has a wife. He has a wife. Now, you see, now decisions are in his ballpark. Proverbs 18.22 Jacob can express can accept this as a gift from God, like Proverbs 18:22, like Genesis 2:22, and the Lord brought the woman to the man. The Lord brought the woman to the man. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. Or he can reject her. But if it doesn't change. But if he rejects her, it doesn't change her status as his monogamous wife. You understand that? St she's still his wife. It's still his first wife. Right? I mean, that's a done deal. Paper's been signed. It's a sealed. But now he has a choice. He shouldn't. Because the Bible makes it clear to him as a believer that marriage is monogamous. You know, when I first started in ministry, we used to say, until death do you part. And young couples today don't want that. But you know, it's a biblical concept. It comes from Romans, the seventh chapter. Until death do you part comes from Romans, the seventh chapter, to the church. Well, anyhow. And so, you know, I had choices to make. I'm not going to marry you that way. Here are the biblical, here are the biblical things. You want to get married, go get a judge or get somebody else that don't care about the rules and regulations of the word of God. And I wasn't called to marry people. I was called to preach to them. Jacob accept, can accept his wife as the gift of God's grace or reject her, but it doesn't change her status as his monogamous wife. And if you want more information on that, you should go in there and the English makes it clear you shouldn't have any problem with it. Genesis 2, 18 through 25, which is the prototype of all marriages. I mean, that's what we go by in the ministry. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're a priest or a pastor, who you are. They go by that rule in the Christian church. God, God helped Jacob by removing options. By removing options. So that it fell in Romans 8, 28. God works all things together for good. But you got to believe that. You got to know that. You got to believe that. That's not the way the world thinks. Listen, we don't, we don't operate from the way the world thinks. We operate from the way the word of God works. That's why we're Christians. That's why we're believers. We are not like the world. We're in the world, but not of it. Unfortunately, Jacob rejected Leah's God's gift for his wife. How do we know it? Because she tells us. And the scripture says it. The scripture in verse 30 said that God saw that Leah was not loved. Now listen, Ephesians the fifth chapter says every woman should know that she's loved. 
It's the husband's primary responsibility in Ephesians, the fifth chapter. Husbands, love your wife. This has always been true, but it's exceptionally true for us. <clears throat> now, here's the second point. Well, I, I got a couple other things on the next page. Watch the thens. Now, Jacob, he didn't have a choice in who to marry. He thought he did, but he didn't. Now, he's got choices. Now there are options. Joseph chose bigamy over God's choice of monogamy. Bigamy is so far out as acceptable, it's unbelievable, as far as the biblical principle of divine institution called marriage. Jacob knew this because he had Genesis 2, 18. He had Genesis 2, 18 through 25. The next thing Jacob did is he chose Rachel over God's choice of Leah. We know Leah is God's choice. We know that because of Matthew, he, the genealogy of Jesus Christ went through Judah, which was the last son of Leah. So this is, not, this is not up for grabs. This is not my opinion. It's fact. Okay? The third option, the third, the third choice, he rejects the Bethel Theophany. You remember the Bethel Theophany? This is so huge. This guy has a, listen, he has an appearance of God at Bethel. This is big. Listen, in the Old Testament, this is huge. I can't begin to tell you. Few people get, get a theophany, an appearance of God. And listen, it's famous, in, it's famous in the Old Testament. It's famous in the New Testament. All little kids learn about Jacob's ladder. Climbing of Jacob's ladder. Remember that? Everybody, every little kid learns this. It's a huge story. But. Kids learn it because it's just a cute, then they got a little song that goes with it. But listen, in that theophany, God got it down in verses, that's in the 28th chapter. In the 20th chapter, verses 13, 14, and 15, God got it down technical in Bible study. He said, "Take well, here's point one, here's point two, here's point three. Did you get it? Right? And listen, here's what he basically says to him. He, he, in verse 13, he lays out the Abrahamic covenant and that he is the heir to it. In verse 14, what that means. In verse 15, he tells him, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will walk you from this, listen, from this point right here at Bethel, I will walk you into this and walk you back to the land. I will, I will walk with you through the decisions you've got to make. He told him that in verse 15. Look, at, here I am. Look at verse 15. Go to 28, 15, because we're right here. 28, 15. Look at what he says. See, in 13, he talks about the Abrahamic, uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And then what this means in the Abrahamic covenant about descendants. What are we talking about when he talks about descendants? We're talking about this messianic seed. I went through that the other day. We're talking about Galatians 3.16. The Messianic seed. Then, and that's 14. Then in 15, here's what he tells him about what God will do for him personally right now in time. Do you understand me? He's at Bethel. He's going to Haran. He's, you know, running away. He's going to pick up a wife, right? He's going to get a wife. And then he's going to come back, right? That's the plan. Tell me you know that's the plan. That's the plan. All right. So in verse 15, Here's what God says to him. This is where it gets really personal. And listen, this is what salvation is all about. It's having a personal relationship with God who is now your daddy, not some big guy carrying a stick. This is your, this is a personal guy. This is your Abba father, your pater, your Abba pater. This is your daddy. And listen what he says in verse 15. Behold, this is like, get this down, 
son, memorize this. Behold, I am with you. I will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I've promised you. Do you understand how important that is? You will not make one step from when you leave Bethel and you go to Haran and you leave Haran and go back to Canaan. You will not make one step that I will not walk you with and I will help you with every decision, but lean on me. You understand? I will do what I've promised you. And he laid his promises out in 13 and 14, Abrahamic covenant. Please tell me you know that. Because see, if you don't, if you don't grasp that, then you're going to approach this whole subject matter we're into from a human viewpoint perspective rather than a divine viewpoint perspective. And the Bible wants you to see how God works. All right, and that's what this is all about. I will, I will not leave you. I will walk, I will walk you. Do you understand that? I will walk you. And listen, that promise is still Hebrews, the 13th chapter says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That he speaks that to us, the church. I mean, you might make bad decisions. You don't have to, even when there's no options. Is God with you? Of course he is. Will he walk you out of them? Yes, he will. God is good. He's not evil. He is good. And what he's given you is good for your life, even whether you know it or not. The doctrine of principle. God promises to give us what we need, not what we want. Here it is, Philippians 4.19. This is your verse. My God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. He will supply all your needs. It's, there's not a promise here of wants. There's a promise of needs. Here's point number three. Jacob's course of bad decisions will resort in more hard lessons of life. And if you study the life of Jacob, and, and listen, you ought to. You ought to follow this story through to the end. It has a happy ending. It's a hallmark. It, it, but listen, you're going to have to read a whole lot to get there because a whole lot of life is going to go through before this thing is healed up. I mean, a lot, a lot of life of bad decisions. Jacob's course of bad decision will result in more hard lessons of life. And listen, this is not only going to be in Haran, but when he goes back home, it's going to be that way. And it's going to be when he's forced out of his home and he goes to Egypt, it's still going to trail. I'll tell you, you can set some things, you can set some courses in your life. It's hard to correct. Because you're no longer in control. They're in control. They run. They run wild. And, and listen, his life's an example of this. Built off from bad decisions, bad choices that did not have to be made. Unfortunately, because of, listen to me now, this is important. Unfortunately, because of his position in the divine institution of marriage of authority over others, his bad choices now affect those under his authority. They affect Leah. They affect Rachel and later his children. And boy, do they. Come on now. I mean, this love for Rachel was so out of whack that even the kids knew it. This was not normal love he had for Rachel. It was so out of whack. Even the kids knew it because he treated them that way. Ray, Leah's kids and everything that came from that side. <laughs> I gave him a meal and the rest of us. Uh, that's it. But her two boys. I mean, gave him that coat, you know, and I did it. Well, anyhow, I'm just telling you. 
listen, these bad decisions that you make, you think you're in control of, first thing you know, they're in control of your life. Bad decisions. Have you not seen people who made got into bad decisions being one right after another and the first thing you know they're, 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 they're just sunk. Now it doesn't mean that God can't turn the whole thing around because he did in Jacob's life in the very end of his life unfortunately and he can turn it around but it'll take all of God and less of you. You know you get saved because it's 100% God and zero you. I didn't see you on the cross except in Christ and neither me. These bad choices resulted in abusive behavior, which I'm going to talk to you about the next time. These bad choices that Jacob's making results in abusive behavior towards Leah and towards his children. Listen, this bad behavior is going to come back to bite him when they get their authority over him. It goes back to get him, right? Look how they treated that man. How these, how these children treated him. These bad choices resulted in abusive behavior. Listen, the only thing that can change this whole thing, and listen, the story of Jake's wonderful because God got into Joseph's life and changed it all. And Joe, God, God, 100% God in his life changed the whole family in, in the end, didn't it? Yes. I mean, God can work this way, but people got to, some, somebody in that family's got to start making good choices. Boy, I mean, this story, this story of Jacob is a phenomenal story. And, and listen, this is where the families are wrecked. And we got them, we're, we're up to eye, our eyebrows in them in the church today, just like they were then. I mean, it's, it's the most disheartening thing as a pastor, as you can imagine. I, I, I've had to deal with kids that were three, four, and five years old that were already messed up because of parenting. I mean, really messed up. And listen, I've been long enough with this family that, that that kid that I dealt with at four is now 24, and he's still a mess, and he's been saved. He was saved in our ministry and just never could put it together. I mean, just wound up and full of nothing and and now he's 24 and I, you know I still reach out to him I go like you know he runs and like hides and does that you know but every time I find him in town I try to get a hold of him because parents says he'll tell me that stuff but and he's respectful to me but he's not interested in it and that's sad Listen, I knew he was going to be, because he was a mess at four, and his parents did not. They cared that he was a mess, but wouldn't be part of the solution to his life, would not be part of it. Bad choices. Bad choices affect more than your life. Once you're in a position of authority over your wife and over your children, it has an enormous effect because you're a position you hold. A position in divine authority over others, bad choices affect those under. From a worldly hum human viewpoint, one might say Jacob had every reason for his bad behavior and bitterness. Human viewpoint, not biblical. The Bible won't let you do that. Won't let you do that. But from a human viewpoint, I can understand that. But if you look at it from a biblical standpoint, it takes that away. From a, world, from a worldly human standpoint, one might say Jacob had every reason for his bad behavior, the way he treated people in his family, and for his bitterness. Except Jacob didn't operate under worldly old man thinking. He operated, listen, because he's saved, he should be operating as a Christian thinks, not as a world man thinks. This is, listen, if you've been born again, you're under a whole different set of regulations and rules in your life. It's called the word of God. All that human viewpoint stuff you got, you got to get rid of. It's going to destroy your life as a believer because you got to operate by God's standards. You, listen, Ephesians 6, 6, doing the will of God from your heart, doing the will of God. How do you learn the will of God? From the study of the word of God. From the word of God comes the will of God. From the will of God comes the work of God. It's a system. 
You've got to understand that, how important this is. Listen, so Jacob, I, if Jacob came into me and at Chick-fil-A and said, Ron, look, I got a mess. What am I going to do? I, here's what I'd say to him. What's the Bible say? What does God's word say about this? Your solution is found in the word of God. It's, it's not. You just don't throw it up and hit on, on the wall and figure out what it is. Listen, you go to the word of God. He'll, he'll make it clear to you. That's his responsibility. He told Jacob, I will, I will walk every step into Haran and every step out of it and back. I will teach you to to walk with me, talk with me, pay attention to me. I'm the big cheese. This will be a great, listen, if you do that, this will be a great journey. It, this will be a great starting in your life. Your life will change wonderfully if you do this. And of course he didn't. He was not willing to do that. I'll make my own choices. I'll do my own thing. That's how you get in trouble. Like, like your parents, probably like, probably like your parents, my grandparents who raised me told me two wrongs don't make a right. You ever heard that? Well, imagine when the two wrongs become a multitude of wrongs. And listen, when you start in a series of bad decisions, the two wrongs, listen, will become 20,000 wrongs. When you study the life of this family all the way through, all the way through, it's a mess. And it shouldn't be. These are the patriarchs. These are the patriarchs of Christ. I don't know who you think this family is, but they're a big deal in the plan of God. These, this is a big deal. Imagine when these two wrongs turn into a multitude of wrongs directed against your mate and your children. See how that's going to affect them. This is the rest of the history of Jacob's family. And one might say, two wrongs don't make a right. Someone might say, well, who's counting? You said a multitude of wrongs. I'll tell you who's counting. Leah. She's counting. First child, second child, third child. Well, she's still talking about the same thing, ain't she? She's talking about the same thing. And God did a wonderful thing for her that he wanted to do to Jacob. He turned around and did it for Leah. I'll walk you out of this mess. I'll walk you out. And that got in her heart and her fourth child. She changed over and submitted her entire life over to the Lord. Listen, listen, Lord. I'm in, look, I'm in a monogamous marriage on my side. And I'm going to praise you from this day forward. I'm going to stop bellyaching, moaning, groaning, complaining about what, what life I have. I'm going to turn my life over to you. I'm going to surrender my will to your will. I'm going to, and will you walk me? I, I promise I'll walk. And listen, as far as we know, that's true. This was a real big change in her life this day when she said, listen, I surrender my will to the will of God. Listen, Mary did it with, with, the, birth, with the virgin birth business. When, Andrew was at, when Gabriel got through talking to her, it, it was like, what, well, what am I going to tell the Lord? He said, tell the Lord I salute him and I'm driving forward on it. I'm going to do his will. And what an enormous moment that was in her life in the plan of God. Right? Now, listen, I have no other option but to do the will of God. No other option. Listen, that's the best option. When there are no options, that's the only option that really matters is do the will of God. Jacob, do the will of God. I can't tell you anything. I mean, this is the best counseling you will get to your Christian life. I mean... I'll tell you who count, always counts. I'll tell you the one who always counts is the one who's being offended. And the one who's oblivious is, one who is the offender. He's oblivious. I don't understand what you're so upset about. <laughs> Maybe those are the words that kill you. Look at point four and I'll close this out. 
Lee has spoke some of the saddest words ever heard from a believer in an abusive marital relationship. Now, this is not a guy that beats her up. He verbally does it. He, he verbally does it. He withdraws from her. He puts her in isolation. He makes, it, he makes it very clear to her that I don't love you. Whether he says it or doesn't say it, she's got it. I got the message. That's abuse. I'm going to talk about it next time. Leah spoke some of the saddest words ever heard from a believer in an abusive marital relationship. Verses 30 through 35. The Lord saw that Leah was unloved. And Leah expressed her broken heart of marriage in all the naming of the children. Listen, the, Rick hit it right on the head. When, he, when Rick said, that's kind of unusual for the woman to be naming. Yes, it is. Because we have a husband absent. We have a father absent. You know what I mean? N not because of anything. Be because of choice. Absent because of choice. Call him what you want. Call him what you want. And so she names the first one Reuben. Because the Lord has seen my afflictions. Surely now my husband will love me. Simeon. Simon. Because the Lord, she, she cry, cries, because the Lord has heard that I am unloved. He has therefore given me this son also. L Levi. Now this time, third, third time will be a charm. My husband will become attached to me. Because I have borne him three sons. But you know what? It didn't happen. It didn't happen. And so she did what a smart person does. She turned her life over to the Lord. She turned her life over to the Lord. Because listen, there is one person in this world that will love you unconditionally forever, no matter what. And that's the Lord. You can read about this in 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, verses 4 through 8, and then the last verse. But let me tell you, those verses, this is the love that God will give you. Well, let me close in reading that. Let me just close by reading that, and then we'll, we'll get out of here. 1 Corinthians 13, look at this. This is the love that God will give you. And he'll give you this. And listen, this is sufficient love. This is the love that will carry Leah through life it's not Jacob listen Jacob will never love her he's going to carry this thorn in his flesh to death to hers he'll never, he's never going to do it that's bitter and listen let me tell you do not forget I put it on your paper somewhere I wrote down Ephesians 4 31 32 and boy you be sure to read that because let me tell you, bitterness, of, don't, don't go there. Listen to what he says. There are 15 things about love. There are 15 factors of unconditional love. This is what God will do in your heart for you. God will put this in your heart. God, this is the love that God will love you with. There are 15. Pay attention to the positive and negatives. Because even when they're negative, they're positives. Now watch this. This is, this is God's love on your behalf. God's love is patient, is kind, is not jealous, does not brag, does, is not arrogant. Notice those negatives? That's how others treat you. That may be how others treat you. But God will flip that, turn it back to God, and God will flip that. And love you. What they can't do, he can do. You understand? And so that's what he tells you. See, the negative side of this is how Leah is getting love. Oh, Jacob, J this guy. Uh, oh, yeah, he comes in. I know what he wants. And that's all he wants. That's how she got four kids. But love is patient. Love is kind. It's not jealous. See, th th this is what Leah has to deal with. Because it is jealous. And it, it, it is prideful, it is arrogant, does, it, it does not act becomingly, unbecomingly. 
It does not speak its own. It does not provoke, does not take into account the wrong suffered. You see, that's the Leah side of, the, of it. But you see, there's a God side of it. And listen, though that may be the reality in your life, in your marriage, listen to me. Do not hang on to that. That will soil your soul. That will, that will, that is bad for your soul. Don't hang on to that. Don't hang on to what not the love you're not getting. You're getting the bad side of it. Listen, go to the side that God has. God will flip all of that. Don't hang on to that. Do you understand what he's doing here? Oh, please tell me. You understand why he put these negatives. There are 15 things here. Uh, eight, eight, uh, seven are positive and eight are negative to show you don't hang on the negatives. This is, listen, people say I love you and this is what they give you. Right? They'll say I love you, but this is what they give you. Come on. Do you not see that? Uh, does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but now, now he comes back to the positive, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never fails. You see, look, the wonderful part of this is God says, here's what you get right here. Here's what you may get, and this is what is experienced. Don't dwell on that. Let me flip it. I will flip it. Don't dwell on that. See, Leah started dwelling on that. Did she not? I'm unloved. I'm not this. I'm not getting that. I'm not getting that. She dwelled on it. And listen, if she stayed there, she would have rotted. Her soul would have rotted in her body. Her soul would have shriveled up and died. But you see, she comes back to God with it. She comes back to God. And God tells her, listen, listen. I can't change his heart about this. I can change yours about it. I can't change his heart. He, he's not listening to me. I can't do anything about that. Here's what you're getting. Don't dwell on that. Let me flip that. Let me flip that and let me give you. I will, I will take that. That's not love. Do not let that rot your soul. Give that to me and let me put in you what is healthy and give him what he don't deserve. Let him give him unconditional love. This is in 1 Corinthians 13 to you and I. So it is. If you're Leah, flip it. Flip it. Flip it. You don't have to go through all that. It's not about another man. It's about, it's about getting your heart healed. Get your heart healed. Your heart healed. So, Father, we're thankful tonight for these who come our way by the automobile and by the internet. We pray for those who would visit on the internet. You stay with us, stay with us on Wednesday night. We also are on Tuesday night, but stay with us. Get into this subject matter and stay with us that God can begin to show you things and develop things in your life that could bring happiness, contentment, patience, kindness, goodness, all those kind of things into your heart when your heart has been stunned and broken and beaten up by other, other people. It, you don't have to remain there. You don't have to be a victim. You can be a victor. You can be an overcomer, the Bible says. Flip it. Don't dwell on the negative. Dwell on the positive. Surrender your will to God. Let God put in you what is needed with you. Let him meet your need to be loved unconditionally. Where the side effects are patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and all those things. We're so thankful for that, Father. Oh, Father God, we're just so thankful for that. I mean, how can we possibly thank you that this is a gift? From heaven to us. Not as the world serves. But as the Lord serves. And for that we salute you and love you. In Jesus name. Amen. Mm -hmm.